Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so as he said, my name is Marconi. Um, I oh, sorry. Let's get this started again. Uh, my name is Marconi. I work for Originate. Uh, I've been working with Scala for over five years, and I'm a speaker at many Scala conferences, and I organize Scala Up North. It's the only Scala conference in Canada. Um, what I have here, this is the Scala REPL. Um, and I'm using an open source tool, an open source presentation tool that I created. Um, I created on a plane actually when I was going to a conference in Boston in the middle of the winter. And my plane took like two hours to the ice, so I had nothing to do. And I had this idea for a presentation tool in the Scala REPL. And this tool was created in the Scala, it was created on a plane. But other than that, this is just the Scala REPL. Uh, before I start here, just to have an idea, who here would consider themselves a Java developer? Okay, a handful of people. Uh, Python developer? No, Java, server side JavaScript? Okay, a little bit more. Ruby? PHP? Okay, so, uh, seems a very, very diverse uh, audience. Uh, Scala has a REPL, many languages have a REPL. Uh, PHP has a REPL, Ruby has a REPL, Python has a REPL. Even Java now is gonna have a REPL with Java 9. So I can just type comments here, let's say one plus one equals two. Uh, since we have a lot of JavaScript people in the audience, I'm gonna do 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2. And of course, the result is no surprise to anyone, okay? <laughs> And just to make you truly comfortable, uh, I can do something like, you know, empty parents equals uh, a nested empty parents. And of course, it's true. Okay, so you JavaScript developers should be very at home here. But the, this is just the, the repo. Just wanted to, to tell you that everything that's going to happen here is live code being executed by Scala. Okay, so why Scala? Uh, no, this is a full stack conference, and most people here, I believe, they use dynamic language, so why talk about a statically typed language? So, Scala is an expressive, elegant, and powerful language with a clean and flexible syntax that is concise but not terse, that allows us to write more with less code, so we can spend more time compiling it. Okay. It runs on the JVM, and it's fully interoperable with Java. You can call Java code from Scala, you can call Scala code from Java or any other JVM language for that matter, okay? And a single line of Scala can leverage an impressive amount of JVM power. So Java is this very powerful platform, but the language, people have a, a bad reputation that the language is too verbose. And what I wanna show you in this talk is that a statically typed language doesn't need to be verbose, it can give you all the power that a dynamic language gives you, all the expressiveness that a dynamic language gives you. Okay, but this talk is not a Scala tutorial. I'm not here to teach you Scala. Um, that said, I'm gonna give you just a very few brief words about the language, just to introduce you, uh, introduce you to, to, to the language in case you're not familiar with Scala. Okay, so Scala is a functional, object-oriented, compile, safe, static, strongly typed programming language that favors immutability and provides modern features like type inference, first-class functions, closures and lambdas, macros, straights, pattern matching, option types, extension methods, properties, uniform access, string interpolation, named and default parameters, symbolic method names, which some people call operator overloading, tuples, support for internal domain-specific language, DSLs, and facilities for reactive, concurrent, and parallel computation, including futures, promise, parallel collections, and actors. And I truly hope I didn't forget anything about the language there. I promise you, this is the only slide that's gonna have a lot of text, okay? So Scala is a pure objective language, you know, contrary to Java. Java is not pure object-oriented language. All values in Scala are objects, okay? There are no primitive types, there are no static members, there are no operators. Uh, every operation in Scala is a method call on an object, on an instance of a class. 
And Scala is a functional language in the sense that functions are first class values. They can be passed to other functions. They can be returned as value. They can be assigned to variables. They can be stored in collections. You can do with a function anything you can do with a string or an int. Uh, it turns out then that if all values are objects and all functions are first class values, the functions themselves are objects in Scala. Okay. But Scala is not a pure functional language in the sense that mutability is forbidden. So we know languages like Haskell uh, that are pure functional languages where you have no side effects. Scala is not like that. You can have side effects in Scala, you can have mutability in Scala, but the language is going to favor, it's going to encourage immutability. Uh, so here's a, a quick uh, example of a, a short piece of Scala code. Uh, I have a, a var s that is string and I assign a to the var uh, and I have a var i that is an integer I'm going to assign i to the, the variable and the results are here, not surprising. But since the language has type inference, I do not need to annotate the types. I can just say var s equals string a and the compiler knows that that variable is of type string. So if I run here, the results are the same. I do not need to annotate all the types all the time. Um, since this is a variable, I can reassign it a uh, new value. So I can put B there, or I can put, uh, I'm sorry, this didn't print. Or I can you know, add true to, to I, and now I is three. But if I try to assign a zero to S, or a double to, 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 to I, I'm gonna get a type mismatch error. So even though I did not put the type there, the, the language is still statically typed, it's still strongly typed, I cannot assign an integer to a string, I cannot assign a double to an integer. You know, the language will not allow it, even though the types are not written. Uh, but the very interesting thing here is when instead of a var, I use a vol. So it's just one character change, and I think this is very genius, because now those variables, they are immutable. Uh, so, if I run here, at first the, the results are the same, but if I try now to reassign those variables, I'm going to get an error, a reassignment to val, because those are not variables, they are constants, you know, they are immutable. Uh, and I think that having var and val, it's amazing because in, in Java, for instance, you have to, to write final. You know, and final goes at the beginning. So after you created your variable, you have to go back and write final, and it's verbose, it's pedantic, it's noise. People don't use it be just because it feels pedantic. And here, no, you can change your mind. It's just one keystroke away, and you can uh, change back to immutable values. So this is an example of how the language motivates you to use immutable values. It makes it very easy for you to give a preference to immutable values. So let's see now some of the most elegant and powerful Scala onliners, you know, using only language features and the standard library. So I'm not using any third part library here. It's just battery included, everything that the language gives to you. Okay. Our example were tested with the latest versions of Scala and Java. Uh, a warning before we get started. This is not code golf. You know, one liners is not about writing the shortest code possible. Uh, crypto onliners do not impress anyone. No code responsibly, right for readability. So let's begin with the power of onliners. So all other things being equal, a shorted method is easier to read, easier to understand, and easier to troubleshoot. Okay. Refactor long methods into smaller methods if you can. Okay. Always try to write code at the highest level of abstraction possible. You no know, closer to humans, away from the bare metal machine. So that's the idea behind this talk. Uh, tell the computer what to do, not how to do it. Okay, so the ultimate Scala one-liner is something that we call a case class. And why it's called a case class is gonna be clear very soon. Uh, so case class, even a simple one like this one with just a few parameters can give you what would take dozens if not hundreds of lines of, of Java code to produce the same result. Uh, so everything that a case class gives to you. So it gives to you getters, okay? When you define a case class, automatically you get the getters for that class. You, if you want, you can have the setters. They are optional. 
By default, they are not there, but it's very easy for you to specify them. You just add var to the declaration. And you have methods like two string equals and hash code. So people from Java know that you have to write those by hand with a case class. You don't need that. The compiler generate same methods for you. You have a copy method, and this is very interesting because it's an alternative to setters and it's immutable. So it's an immutable way to change a value without changing the values. You know, it's this is how you, you get away with not having setters. You use the copy method. You have serialization, um, and there are other methods that would not make sense if you're not familiar with Scala. And also you have something that is called the companion object. A companion object is a singleton object that has a very special relationship with the class. Um, because in Scala we don't have static, so we use this companion object. It has an apply, which is a factory method for you to create new instance. It has an apply, which is a very interesting method. I believe this is the main reason people who use Scala are going to, to use case class. It's a structure method for use for pattern matching, and I'm going to just show you what that means. And if you're familiar with, with functional programming, it also gives you curved and tuple methods for, for you. We're going to show an example too. Okay. So let's see some examples. I'm going to define my case class here, person, uh, name, and age, and I'm going to create a person, Jim, who is age 24. And you see that I don't have to put new person because that is not a constructor. That is a factory method that the compiler generate for me. So now I have my Jim instance here. And as I said, we have getters and I can just call Jim.name. Getters in Scala, they do, they, Scala has properties. So getters in Scala do not have get name, set name. They're just dot name, okay? So it returns Jim. And I can, can, for instance, test if Jim age is greater than 18. Of course it is. Uh, the method's to string. So you see that to string here, it's going to give me person, Jim 24. It's a more meaningful representation than what you get by default in Java. Um, hash code, not very interesting. And the equals, just to make sure that uh, I'm trying to trick the compiler. So I'm creating a different instance. And is this new instance the same as the previous one? And this may be a little surprising for, for Java developers. It is, because equals in Scala is not reference equality. It really goes to the contents of the variables to, to see if two instances have the same values, not if they have the, the reference to the same location in memory. Okay? And so one thing that is fun is that, by coincidence, today is Jim's birthday. Okay, so, and we're gonna have to, to Add one to his age. But uh, if I try to run that, I'm going to get a reassignment of all. Remember, the case class is immutable, so I cannot do that. So what I do, I use the copy method. So now I have my gym, I'm going to copy it. And I'm, when I do this copy, I'm going to assign him a different age. Uh, all the other fields, they just come for free. You do not have to specify all the other fields. So just specify what is changing, in this case, the age. Um, I think I could skip this here. Uh, it's more for functional programming. So pattern matching is more interesting to you. Um, just do not confuse it with regular expressions. Pattern matching is not the same as matching and regular expression. Uh, so to show how, how powerful pattern matching is, I'm gonna make it a little bit more complex here. So I'm defining a case class with a, li a little bit more structure. Uh, I have a gender. Uh, this is called an abstract uh, algebraic data type. Um, so it has two values, male and female. I have a case class date, that it's a day, a month, and a year. And I'm using int and strings here, not being very rigorous. I just wanted to show an example. And then I have my person with a name, gender, and a birthday. So the birthday itself is a case class, OK? So this is how I create instance. I have a person, Jim, that is a male, and his birthday is November 14, 1990, and I have Jane. Uh, you see that I do not have to put new date as well, just like I don't have to put a new person here. So now I run, and I have my instances. And now here is, is pattern matching. So I want to salute a person, okay? And what I have here is a... Uh, 
a match, which is somewhat similar to a switch statement in many languages, have a switch. Uh, but a match is a lot more powerful because it's doing pattern matching. So you can see that here I want to match a person. I don't care about the name, I don't care about the birthday, I just care about the gender. So I'm going to ask if this person is male or female. So the underscore there is saying ignore this field and just match on the second field if it's a male. So now if I try to salute Jim and Jane, um, I'm going to get the, the different messages because of pattern matching. It gets a lot more powerful than that. So I can have here, I, I don't care about name and gender, I just care about the, the birthday. Uh, so if your birthday is today, so it matches the day and the month, I don't care about the year. So I'm going to say today is your birthday. And if the month matches your birthday, I'm going to say your birthday is this month. So you see that I can nest my matches, you know, I'm ignoring everything that is in person itself and I'm matching inside the nested case class on some of those fields. So when I run this, uh, says that today is your birthday and your birthday is this month. It gets even more powerful yet. So now what I'm doing here, I'm putting placeholders. So yes, I'm ignoring the name. I don't care about the name, but I want you to store that name in a variable for me. Uh, and on the second case, I'm also uh, match on the day. I don't care which day you were born, but I want to start this day so I can reuse it. And you see that I have a string interpolation there. So I'm going to say today is someone's birthday, and someone's birthday is on such day of this month. So when I run this code, it says that today is Jean's birthday, and Jane's birthday is on the third, first, second, ooh, 23rd of this month. So you see, how, how powerful this can be, how, how easy it is for you to extract values from your data structures. And you can do a lot, lot more than that. I, I would not have, I could spend an entire talk just about pattern matching. Um, one thing that I think it's very useful, uh, remember I said that this is an extractor method, so you can use it to extract methods. So I have extract values. So I have here vault date, I'm gonna ignore the day, but I want the month and the year. And the syntax may be a little surprising the first time you look at it, but what this is going to do is going to declare two variables, month and year, and assign to them the values that are in Jim birthday. So when I run here, I have this month is November and year is 1990. So there's a lot of power that you get on that. So extension methods on Java types. Uh, Scala has extension methods, so you can add methods to, to existing class even if the classes are final, like string in Java, you can add methods to string in Scala. So this is very powerful. So for numeric types, I have things like uh, .abs, which returns me the, the absolute value of a number, uh, min and max, uh, signum, which is minus one, zero, and one, uh, depending if the number is negative, positive, or zero. And I have range. So I can have a range 1 to 10 or 1 until 10 and 1 to 10 by 2. So what this is going to give me is all the numbers between 1 and 10, all the numbers from 1 up to but not including 10, and then just the numbers you know, 2 by 2, 1, 3, 5, 7. Those are ranges. Uh, for float and, and doubles, uh, we have things like seal, floor, round, 2 int. No surprise here. Um, two degrees, two radians, uh, is a valid int and is whole. So there's a difference here because an, a number may be whole, but it doesn't fit inside the int. It is too big a number to fit inside the int. So there's a difference between is valid int and is whole. So here are some different results. Uh, for char, we have is digit, is letter, is letter, or digit. Um, it's upper, is lower, two upper, two lower, is white space, okay. And also I can have range um, on chars. My range are not limited to, to, to integers. So when I run that, I get all the letters from A to Z or some of them skipping others. Uh, a string, so I have a, star operator, multiply that it's going to give me a string that many times. I can ca capitalize a string. 
I can compare it in our case. Okay. Uh, and if I have a multi-line string, so you can see that with triple quotes, Scala has support for multi-line strings. I can just call dot lines and I'm going to get each line uh, from that string separately. So if you're reading a text file, for instance, that's very useful. Um, in Scala, a string is a collection of chars. Okay? It, it's as if it were an array of chars in Java. And most Scala collection methods are supported, so I can call methods, uh, higher order functions like map for all exists. Uh, if you're familiar with functional programming, you probably are familiar with those higher level functions. I'm going to talk a little bit more about them, but here is just an example how to use them. Uh, arrays. Uh, so arrays in Scala, they are actually Java arrays. You know, there, there is no magic happening here. There, there is no special class for arrays in Scala. Uh, when I create an array like that, it is a, a, a Java array. But just like strings, uh, most col Scala collection methods are supported in array through extension methods. So I can also call map and sum on an array, just as if it were a uh, Scala collection. And what I think it's very useful, I can uh, I have pattern matching. I can use call extractors on, 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 on arrays in Scala. So let's say I have a string key column value, and I want to break down that, that string into the two parts. So I can call something like key value split on the, on the column. And what I get back, because the split method is a Java method on string, it's not a Scala method, this comes from Java. So it's going to return me an array. So I have an array key value. So usually we don't want to be using t0, t1 everywhere. We would assign those to, 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 to variables. So key is equals t0, uh, value equals t1, and we will, would use that. But there's a better way to do that in Scala with pattern matching. I just write ball array key value equals key value split. And now what I get here is key is a key and, and value is the value. So you see how we can use pattern matching creative ways to simplify our code. And maybe now, hopefully, the syntax that I showed for the person class makes a little bit more sense. Yes? Is there a second uh, OK, let's, let, what I love about this tool is that we can, can, <laughs> we can play with it. So let's, let's do it live here. So, This? So what happens? Yes, I, I, I get a match error, okay? Because my, my pattern doesn't match the expression that I have. Okay, collections. Uh, most Java collections can be decorated with Scala interface, so no surprise. It's string arrays and all other collections. So what we have are this list of Java collections that are supported, and you can see that most of them are actually interface, so it means that all implementation of those interfaces are supported. Um, so just to give an example here, I'm going to call system.getenv. System.getenv, again, is a Scala method, is a Java method. If I call it here outside my slides, um, it's going to return a Java U2 map string string. Okay. So what I do in Scala, uh, I add a dot as Scala. This is going to convert my Java collection into a Scala collection. Then I can do everything I could do in Scala. So if I run here, you see that the code over there works. Uh, so idioms common to most collection types. Uh, I'm going to use this sequence as an, an example as a Pascal triangle, 1, 6, 15, 20, and so forth. And the first thing is a map method. Okay, So what map, it, it takes for every value in a collection, it's going to apply a function, and it's going to return me a new collection with the results of that function applied to each element of the first one. So this is how you, you do it in Scala. You don't overwrite values on a collection that you have. You create a new collection with the new values that you want. This is immutability. So when I run this, uh, I'm going to get all the numbers doubled, no surprise. 
But that syntax over there can be simplified uh, because I have just one variable being used and used only once. So I do not need to name that variable. I can put just an underscore. Uh, the underscore is kind of a wildcard. And now I get the same result with that. And there are even simpler ways to do that. Uh, remember that I said that everything in Scala is an object? So true, the, 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 the integer to the literal number two is an object, and I can call a method on that object. And remember that I said that all functions in Scala are objects. So this is what happened here. There is this function star multiply that is defined in the integer class, and what I'm saying, this instance of integer, true, and this method that I define on that class, this is a function. So that's the function that I want you to apply on my collection. So this is why I can write just map two dot star, and this is going to multiply two by all the numbers. The results are, again, all the same. Okay. Uh, I can use reduce. The, the reduce will take the first element and apply an operation to two elements, so the first and the second one, and then you're going to get the result and apply to the third and the fourth and so on and so forth. You're going to scan your entire collection. Uh, so what this is doing is sum all the elements, but there's an even shorter way. You can just call dot sum. Uh, of course, there is also dot product. Um, I'm gonna, now I'm going to use this helper function. It's even, uh, nothing special about it. I just need another function to show you some things. So I'm going to ask if in my collection exists a number that is even. So this is how I write it in Scala. Okay. Uh, I can ask for all, okay? Exist means at least one. Now I'm going to ask for all, so it means all of them. No, I mean not all of them are even. There are some odd numbers there. Uh, I can count how many numbers are even. Okay. I can find the first number that is even. And note here that I'm returning, instead of int, I'm returning an option int with the sum. So I, I said that that slide at the beginning that Scala has optional types. So what happens when find doesn't find anything? What is the return value? In Java, usually you would return null, okay? Which is not a good idea because null is not an object. You have a null point exception. In Scala, we have just optional type. That is something that there is a value or there is no value. So this is a type safe way for you to represent something that doesn't exist. Filtering and grouping. So I can filter all the numbers that are even or all the numbers that are not even. I can partition uh, my collection. So now I have two collections, uh, one with the even numbers, one with the odd numbers. And if you notice that syntax there, it's pattern matching again. I'm pattern match on a tuple, actually, there. So when I have two values in parentheses, that it's a tuple, and I'm using pattern matching to extract the values from the tuple again. Uh, I can group by, which is similar to partition, but allows more than one, um, more than two classes. So here I have uh, divisibility by, by three, so I have the numbers that leave, leave a reminder two, one, and zero. Uh, take while, drop while, it's going to take me all the numbers till some condition is met, or it's going to skip those numbers and return the rest. Uh, span, which breaks down the list in two, so it's a combination of take while and drop while. And I can get a prefix length. So, okay, in my collection, how many of the numbers I have till the first one is less than 20? So three numbers, and then the first one that is greater or equal to 20 appears. I can ask if it contains 20. Okay, uh, pretty simple. I can ask an index of a number and the last index of a number, where it first appears, where it last appears. But what's more interesting, I, I can ask index where and last index where. So I do not pass a value, I pass a function. So the first place where that function is true starts with, ends with, uh, contains slice, index of slice, max and min. Okay, I can also, uh, I'm going to define here different uh, 
so let's say I have a sequence of, of people, you know, names and ages, and I want to see who is the, the oldest one. So I'm going to max by, and I pass a function. So max by age here. Okay. I can sort a sequence of numbers. I can sort by given a criteria. Uh, I can sort with a function. I can reverse a collection. I can reverse and at the same time map the values. So this is for efficiency. So you do just one pass in your collection to produce the end result. Um, I can group them. So three by three. Okay. And you see that if I don't have enough elements at the end, the, the last group is not going to have three elements. And I can have a sliding function that takes three and then drops the first and takes the fourth and goes on a window three by three. Uh, I can make a string with all the elements and I can make some fancy things. I can define a lot of uh, start, beginning, end. Okay. I can ask if a sequence intersects with a different sequence. Uh, the difference between sequence, uh, the union between sets. Uh, if, a sub, if a set is a subset of a different set, uh, I can get all the subsets of a set, and I can get all subsets of a given size. I can get all the combinations, all the permutations. Okay, those those are very useful. Uh, methods for you on job interviews. Uh, can ask for distinct elements. And if I have just sec sequences and I want to compare them element by element, I can have this function correspond that will take one element from the first sequence, the, the first element from the second sequence, compare them, and then move on to the next element on each sequence and compare the sequence pairwise. So, yes. Um, I can transpose, so if I have two sequences so with three elements, now I'm going to have three sequences with two elements. So it's like you transpose vertical, horizontal. Uh, I have lift. Just makes more sense maybe to functional people, but you can see here that if I try to access an element that does not exist, I will not throw an exception, I will not return now, I'm just going to say that no, there is no tenth element in my sequence. Uh, parallel collections, this is very interesting in Scala, so they behave exactly like sequential collections, except that the operations, they are transparent performed in parallel using our CPU cores. So this is very powerful feature in Scala. When I have a, a collection, any collection, I can just append dot par, dot par is a method, and this is going to give me a parallel version of that same collection. And now all the operations that I perform on that collection, are, they're going to be in parallel using all four cores in your machine. So this is something that can take to do properly, to do the right way, can take hundreds of lines of Java code. And here in Scala, it's just four uh, characters, if you count the dot. So to show you, pay attention how fast I'm going to sum the number. See how fast it was? Uh, well, of course not. Uh, a small collection like that doesn't make a difference. But just to show that it is indeed parallel, I'm going to just print the elements. So the elements are going to be printed out of order, in a different order every time I call this method, just because they're printing the elements is happening in parallel. Uh, maps. Uh, I can create a map here. So Scala 0, Java 1, Swift 2. And I can, I have a get or else, so if my map contains that value, I return the, the value. If not, I can return a default value. I can filter the keys, all the keys that start with S. I can map the values. Um, and I have get or else update. So I try to fetch a value from my map, if that value is not there, I'm going to insert the value in the map in a single operation. And you can see here, I said that the collection, the, the, the language does not forbid you from using mutability. This is how you can have a mutable collection in Scala. You just import the collection mutable. Uh, 
here are the results. Okay, so let's put it all together. So now it gets a little bit more interesting uh, because I was just showing you a method so far, not really one-liners. So sliding is one that you know people ask, well, why are you going to use a slide for? You know, why take the first three, then drop one, and then. And here an example, I wanted to find the first three consecutive elements whose sum is greater than 40. So how do I do that? I take my collection, I call this sliding tree, and then I call find, uh, and I pass a function to find. So I want you to find the first one whose sum is greater than 40. And if I run this, it's going to return me 6, 15, and 20. So those are the first three consecutive numbers that sum to greater than 40. So pangram, who knows what a pangram is? A pangram is a sentence that has all the letters in the alphabet. So this is a very famous one, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Uh, and I want to see if it really, really is a pangram. I don't know, maybe it's not, maybe there's some letters missing. So how do I do? I create a range of, of charts. So from A to Z, for all those letters, I want to see if my pangram contains that that the letters. So, yes, it does. Okay, but you know, I don't trust this code. I don't believe you. Uh, I want to see it by myself. So, what I'm going to do? I'm going to take the pangram. I'm going to take all distinct characters there, and then I'm going to sort. And that should do the trick. You can make sure by yourself that all the letters are there. But let's do better. Okay, how many times each letter appears in the collection? So, what I'm going to do? I'm going to group by and I'm going to just map them to two lowercase so they count properly. So I have here, okay, not what I wanted. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to map the value so I don't want to have a string without the occurrence of each character. I want to know the size. So I just map the value by size. And now I have that the letter E appears three times as one better, but it's still not, not good. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to uh, strip the, the white space, so I put a filter there, and everything's just like it was before. Okay, so we just have letters, we have no white space here. Okay, first thing I'm going to do to that result is sort them by frequency. So, okay, I want the most frequent first, so now I'm going to use sort by and pass a different comparison function. Okay, and I want to see just the letters that appear more than once. So what I do, I filter the ones who appear more than once. And those are the letters, not too many then. Um, okay. And I want all the words that have the letter O. So what I do, I have my pangram, I break it down into a space that separates the words, and I'm going to filter by the ones that contains O. So it's brown fox over and dog. Uh, are strings that contain at least one of a set of keywords. So I have three strings here, Swift, Java, Scala, and I want to filter from, from, from those headlines, I want to just the ones that have either Scala or Swift. So I have a set Scala Swift and it exists one that the string contains. Um, and here they are. Okay. To plot a horizontal chart, uh, this is very easy. We just saw that I have a, a, a star. Uh, so I just call a string star and I pass the number of times I want that to appear. So when I run this, I get this horizontal chart, not very impressive. Let's see if we can do better. So I'm going to put value labels. So what I have here, I have a string interpolator. Uh, it's the little f there before the code. And what I can do, I can pass a format that will format the, the string. We'll not just interpolate, but we'll also format the string. So now at least I have the values 1, 6, 15, 20, 15. Okay, looks good. Now let's do something a little bit more challenging. I want to plot a vertical chart. Okay, so what I'm going to do here, I'm going to go from the minimum value, to, from, from the maximum value to the minimum value by minus one. So I start with the highest value, and then I go down to I reach the lowest value. And what I'm going to do here, for, for every element on that sequence, I'm going to test if the first element is equal 
to, to, to the line I'm at. If it is, I'm going to put a star. Otherwise, I put a space. So what I'm doing here, it's x and y. So first I go, the y axis is from highest value to lowest value. So each time I go for, for every collection, I go the x all the times, and I go comparing, OK, am I at the right y value here for this x value? It's not a very efficient way, but it works for a one-liner and doesn't look good at all. It's difficult to understand what's happening there. So let's try something a little bit better. I'm going to use a bar chart. Okay, so the only difference instead of testing if it's equal, I'm going to test if it's greater or equal. And when I run that, I get something that, yeah, okay, could be useful. Maybe the, the choice of collection that I use here, the choice of numbers is not the greatest, but I have a vertical chart in a single line of code. I can do even better, okay? So now I have a one liner that technically is two lines, and I'm gonna confess that this is totally showing off. There is no practical value on that. It's not something that I would want to see on a code base for production, for sure. But I just wanted to highlight how I'm using all these small pieces here together. So I'm using a.max, I'm, I'm comparing zero with uh, the minimum value of a collection. Uh, I'm using signum. Okay, so just to, to show you how, how, how the other pieces that I showed you before can be combined to produce a end result. And what I'm going to do here now is to plot the, the sign function. So when I run this code, not too bad. Okay. Uh, sign function in the terminal using two lines of code. And actually, I, I, I like this I, so much that I, <laughs> I'm going to do it again. <laughs> Cos sign function, just for the fun of it. Okay. It's pretty smooth, actually, for, for terminal, I think. Uh, extension methods. So I told you about you can define extension methods in Scala. I showed you some some extension methods that are defined in the, the Scala library, but you can define your own extension method. Extension method. So um, the syntax here does not is not interesting. The only thing that we should know here is that I'm defining a method stars, and I'm defining it on integers. So now if I have an integer, any integer, I can call the stars method. So here, it's going to produce five stars. Um, one method that I like to, to, to add to my projects is on strings, uh, is blank. What it's going to do is going to trim the, the string and see if it's empty. So if the string is just empty space. So I have a sample here, and I'm going to see if it's blank. Yeah, it is blank. It just have space, tabs, new lines, so no actual content. Um, reading the contents of a file, I can very easily read a file. I have a file here on, on, on my file system. And I can show the contents of the file with a single line. Uh, I can process line by line. So I have a get lines. And I'm going to just convert it to a list. So now I have a list with all the lines in that file. So I could apply any function to each and every line. Um, I want to print with line numbers again. I'm going to use the, the format string interpolator here. And now I have line numbers for my, my lines, OK? Uh, and I can select a line of random from the file system. Uh, just usually what I do is I have a small gift, and I have a list of people in the conference. And I use this for <laughs> to gift people. So unfortunately, I could not get, uh, I had no way to know who would be here with five tracks. Um, this is not going to work because the Wi-Fi here, I could not get Wi-Fi. But if I want to read a file from the internet, I can do it with just from URL, and I get the file from the internet. I'm going to have to skip. If it's an XML file, I can just get an XML load, and I'm going to get the file. <clears throat> and it's very, very sad that this will not work here because Scala has support for XML. I can, it's very easy, just, uh, just using the slash, and I, I have an XML file, and I can extract values from the XML. The Scala will parse the XML, and it will give you methods to extract values from that file. Uh, and what would happen here if I had Wi-Fi, I would fetch the Scala news from Google News uh, Live, and would print all the headlines for us right now. 
maybe another time. Uh, I can import instance members. So to simplify code on small scopes, don't do that on a large scope. This is why I have brace there. Uh, I'm not importing <coughs> classes from a package. I'm importing variables from an instance. So I do not have to prefix name and gender with Jane. I'm importing Jane. And it works as if I had written Jane.name and gender. Uh, there is method in my randomness, plenty actually. So Scala has a lot of ways for you to generate a random value. So I can call random.nextInt. It's going to return me random integers. One that I really like is you pass a maximum value. So I want integers up to three, which means that it's going to be zero, one, and two, but not three itself. So it only generates small numbers for me. Doubles. Uh, booleans, yeah, somehow it only generates true values today. Uh, next, printable char, okay, so it gives you some chars. Uh, next, string, and this is, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think it's kind of a little useless. I, I truly hope there is nothing offensive over there. But <laughs> just because of how unique, yes. Well, well, it's random. <laughs> yeah, and there's no way for, for you to, to, to ensure that's going to be unique. Probably it has a very long per period, you know, how the, the pseudo random number generators work. So if you have like a next int, it's going to take a while for you to, to pick uh, the same number again. But if you have something next int three, for sure, you're going to get repeated. So you see next boolean, there is no way you, you can not get. So it's just a reason of uh, how Unicode works. You know, you have 26 or 52 if you count capital uh, Latin letters and you have tens of thousands of Asian letters. So most of the time, I, I don't think I ever got, you know, something that didn't look, at least to my eyes, Chinese or something using this method. But there's something better because there's an alphanumeric that this one, yes, is going to return me just alphanumeric. So it's, there's still hope. Um, and I can shuffle a sequence, okay? Uh, I have a sequence of numbers. I should have been smarter and not pick consecutive numbers. Uh, but it's going to generate a different permutation of that sequence for you every time. Uh, there is one, another one here that it's uh, normally Gaussian distribute value with mean zero and standard deviation one. So when I run this, I'm pretty sure that the statisticians among us can verify that this distribution is normal. If not, if you're not a statistician, train the statistician and you cannot get it. Of course, I'm going to plot it with the function I just created. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to generate a million values, and then I do some normalization because we wanted to see a nice graph. And I'm gonna plot it just like I did it before. Oh, yeah, it looked better when I tried at home. Okay, so pretty close to normal distribution, I would say. I can run it again. Yeah, so yeah, indeed it does seem normal to me. Amazing. So you, you can have fun, you know. It's amazing how, how, how much time I, I wasted on, on this single line. So I'm just going to generate a random number, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, nothing fancy here. And I have a magic number there. I'm not going to tell you where that magic number came from. And when I run this, amazing. Yeah. Finally, <laughs> something that, that raised interest. And uh, let's try a different magic number. And uh, look at that, you know, th that's art. I could print that and, and put it on the wall. So a single line art generator in Scala. Colors, we have colors in Scala, red, green, green and blue. Uh, Preconditions, oh, this is very interesting. Who, who knows uh, design by contract? Okay, so design by contract is you have preconditions, invariants, and postconditions. Uh, 
preconditions I consider them the, the most useful and luckily the, the, they are the easiest to use. So what I have here again, my, my old friend, case class person, you know, I don't want you to create any person. I want to ensure that the name is not empty and, and that the age is not, is greater than zero, it's not a negative age and also that you're not too old. And so I just put a require. So now if I try to create a person that has a blank name, it's gonna say, it's gonna throw an exception and say that name cannot be empty. If I try to create a person with a minus one age, it's gonna say that age cannot be negative. So this is very, very useful uh, for production code. Regular expressions, regular expressions in Scala are very powerful uh, because they're very easy to define. You just add a dot r to a string, dot r is extension method. And since we have triple quotes in Scala, we do not have to escape our backslash. So there's no double backslash. So it's a lot more readable uh, regular expression. So here I have a regular expression to extract a date. Um, okay. And getting the, the groups out of a regular expression, it's even cooler, you know, it cannot be cooler than that. So what I do is I use, of course, pattern matching extractors. So I, I have vol date, year, month, and day, and I pass a string with the date. What it's going to do with just this single line of code, it's going to apply the regular expression to that string, extract the groups and assign the groups to each variable and create a new variable for each value. So when I run it, as amazing as it is, just a single line of code, you know? The same thing with Java, it's, it's not painful, we do it every day, but it's really not that easy, that simple to do. Parsing numbers, so I'm gonna give an example of a more complex pattern matching here. So I have three regular expressions, hexadecimal, octal, and decimal. Um, and I'm gonna give a, create a function that will take a string and will match that string against the regular expressions. And then we'll convert it to an integer. So when I try to pass 0x for a 2, 0 for a 2, and just for a 2, of course, I'm going to get the numbers interpreted in each different base. Okay. Uh, running system process, it's very easy in Scala. I just add an exclamation point, a bang, to, to the comment I want to run. Okay, so if I want to run ls, I call ls.bang. And those are the files that I have in my presentation folder. Okay, but if I want to capture the output, I use a double bang. So now I have a string with the, the comment output and I can do it the string whatever I want. Um, I can even get fancy, I have pipe, so here I'm gonna do a ls and I'm gonna pipe that to a grab. And of course this grab is taking, you know, from, from the find comment, I'm passing the string that I want to grab. And if that grab fails, so I have this conditional pipe here, I'm gonna say not found, okay? So I can try to find Scala and find Java and I should have deleted the, the Java file that I had here before. I can do find uh, .php, I'm pretty sure there is no PHP files on my machine. Yeah, not found. Um, and okay, so that was it. Uh, the, the code for this talk, all the, I, maybe you want to call it slides, but all, all the content from this talk, it's available in GitHub. Uh, you can read a lot more about Scala at blog.originate.com. The tool itself, I told you, it's a tool that I created. It's open source. Uh, it's called Represent. Uh, this is the Scala repo. You can still use the Scala repo to do most of everything that I did here. It, the tool is just used to format the text, okay? Uh, so that's it. Thank you very much for your patience. And do you have any questions? Yes. Mm 
Well, if, if you want to develop web applications, there is the Play framework that is very popular in the Scala community. So it's somewhat similar to Ruby on Rails, and also the, 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 it's an MVC framework that it's convention over configuration. And it, it's interesting because Scala is a type safe language. So Play framework, it gives you type safe routes. And also if you have uh, localhost.com slash user slash ID, and if you put a typo in the URL, the framework is going to tell you, oh, this URL does not exist. This URL is not mapped to a controller. There is no controller that can handle that URL. At compile time, not at runtime, uh, it has type safe templates. So if you have a typo in your HTML template, it will tell you at compile time, or oh, you're trying to access a variable that does not exist. So it's very powerful. You can, there's a project called Scala.js that compiles a Scala code to JavaScript that runs in the browser. And they have bindings for many, many JavaScript libraries like jQuery. And actually what they did, they created a specification of the jQuery API so you can call jQuery in Scala in a type safe manner. If you try to call a method that is not in jQuery, if you pass a wrong parameter to jQuery, Scala is gonna tell you, oh, this is wrong, okay? And there are projects to use Scala to create Android applications. I don't know how well they are. It's not something that I'm very familiar with, uh, Android development, but I do know that there are projects there. So Scala is expanding. They, they have different front ends to, 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 to different targets, no compiler targets. And there are many projects over there doing a lot of interesting things with Scala. My objective here with this talk for, for this audience was to show to some people that maybe don't like a language like Java because of all the flaws that Java has, do not throw the baby with the bathwater, you know? Java is one thing, it's statically typed, it's strongly typed, it's a different thing. Having compile time safety is good for you. And it can be fun, it can be easy to use, you know? Look at this talk, I had one single type annotation and it was on purpose to show you that I could not use them. Okay, all the code here had no type annotations at all. Most of the code here would not look strange to, to a Ruby developer, to a PHP, a Python, whatever, JavaScript. You know, actually it's a lot less verbose than JavaScript for sure. You do not have to be specifying function all the time. And you, you, you have the best of both worlds. So this is what I, I wanted to show to you guys here today, the message I want to give to you is, if you're interested in learning a new language that will add to your toolbox, give Scala a try. You may be surprised at how powerful and flexible the, the, and simple to use the language is if you are used to dynamic language and if you think static languages are verbose and painful to use. Yes. Yes. Okay. So the first question is if there's a Windows version. Of course, this kind of runs on Windows, and you can open the repo in the command prompt. Also, the IDEs have good support for Scala. It's not as mature as Java, of course not. Uh, Java has been the market for almost 20 years now, if not 20 already. Uh, Scala is not that old, so the, the IDE is not that mature, but IntelliJ and Eclipse have, do have good support for Scala. For database, you have, first, Scala is Java, okay? Scala runs on the JVM, so anything that works with Java works with Scala. So you can use NJDBC library that you, you have, you can use Hibernate, you can use JPA if you want, they work with Scala. Uh, but Scala has something that's called Slick, which is a language integrated, it's a funny thing, I don't remember, but it gives you functional access to your database. So the way you write your, your queries to the database is using the functions that I showed you here, map, filter, and then Using macros, I, I didn't talk about macros in, in this talk, but I, I told briefly that Scala has supports to macro. So using macros, the Scala compiler are going, is going to rewrite that expression to a SQL statement. So you can handle your, your database 
uh, tables as if they were a collection in memory. The same interface, you call map on a database, you call filter, and then the compiler translates that expression, that Scala expression into SQL code, sends that to the database and retrieves the results. It's very similar to Microsoft Link that they, they have in C Sharp, I, I believe. It's a very powerful database access library that allows you to not write SQL code. You can write Scala code that gets converted to SQL queries for you. Any more questions? Yes. When, when this talk um, gave crazy with one line, I mean... When your when wife calls you, you <laughs> when the baby starts crying. <laughs> yeah, because it, the thing is very, very dangerous, right? At some point, like, you can go crazy and there's no way that you can, uh, like, read it later. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. I misunderstood your, your question. Okay, because I mentioned that I spent too much time playing with it, I thought that you were referring to that. Yeah. Again, uh, yes, so that's the, the last question. The point here is not to, to try to write everything as a single liner. So what I'm doing here is to show you how much you can accomplish with a very short piece of code. I'm not trying to write the shortest code possible, and if you write production code, some examples here, not, not many, but some examples here I would not recommend. But the vast majority, they were very simple examples. They were, I mean, I cannot think of a better way to write the, the same functions. You know, it's short, it's clear, it's easy to understand, it's easier to, easy to modify. Yeah, but don't, don't try to be too clever, okay? Uh, Brian Carnegie, the K and Carnegie and, and, and Rich Seabook, he, he said that, Debugging is more difficult than writing code, okay? So if you write code at your maximum capacity, it means that you're not smart enough to debug it, <laughs> okay? So keep that in mind. Don't try to be too clever. This is not about being clever. I, I hope I made it very clear at the beginning. This is just to show you that the language can be very powerful with very short statements. You can accomplish a lot, okay? So yeah, don't, don't. If you start asking yourself, am I doing too much, you probably, you know, we're doing too much a few steps before. You should have stopped before. <laughs> yeah, that, that's one. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>